I thought it was time I make a video where I just kind of go on a little bit of a rant, not a scripted video or anything like that, but I get a question a lot that I want to answer. I want to address this. I'm about three to four months late on talking about this topic, but it's about how has my microgreens business been doing during COVID? Um, obviously restaurants shut down everywhere. So that pretty much came to a stop. Um, Farmers markets, I wasn't doing those, but I know a lot of people were. I think those came to a stop. And even now, we're probably still struggling a little bit. And so I just want to tell you what I did and how things worked out for me. So I already wasn't doing a lot of business with uh, restaurants to begin with. I had found that the restaurants that I was selling to were pretty unreliable. I think I had one that was like really consistent and also on top of that, I hadn't been going out seeking more work. I, I wasn't really approaching restaurants anymore to get going. Um, definitely a lot of opportunity to expand into restaurants if I wanted to before COVID happened, but I didn't. And in a way, that's kind of a good thing because that was all taken away like overnight anyways. So what I did do though, is we have in my area, some small like produce shops. Like they basically specialize in produce. It's almost exclusively what they sell. And these are little companies that uh, will go to like the big markets in Boston and get stuff or they'll get things shipped to them from Florida. It's not a whole lot different than what you find at the supermarket, um, but they, they specialize in it. They've got a good following and they do carry maybe a little bit more local product than, uh, than your average supermarket does. Even though a lot of supermarkets these days are really getting into carrying as much fresh local stuff as they can. I haven't approached any of the big, the big uh, retail stores yet to try to get in there. And that's something I may do at some point, but I'm honestly not ready for that. I'm not, I'm not big enough for that. And I don't know if I had the time for that. But anyways, let me get into a little bit about how it works at a small retail location. Now, some of these places can even be uh, like a gas station that just happens to carry a lot of other items. Maybe they try to keep as much on the shelves as they can to support what the local community might need. So they have like some fresh produce, limited amount. They might carry some meats. Um, they carry all your regular retail, like needed items like butter and bacon and uh, eggs and whatnot. So some of those places are worth approaching as well. And I have sold at those places in the past. Uh, but for me, what I found is they were pretty inconsistent. But the little retail places, I produce places I sell to are also pretty inconsistent. So I, I've got a pretty good thing going with one retail location in, in particular. And with that one location, they actually went above and beyond when the COVID thing happened and they started taking online orders. And to do that, they created their own online website, which uh, I can't remember the exact name of it, but it was like almost like a Shopify. It's like a, uh, you can just take and build your own website based on a tool that's already out there that makes it a lot easier for you. It's like, I wish I could think of the name. I want to say it's like Order Spoon or something like that. But anyways, what they did is they took all their products or the majority of their products and they put them on the website and people could order online and then go and um, pick up their stuff, you know, without having to touch anybody, without having to go in the store. They bring it out to your car and deliver it to you. When they started doing that, they found there was a big jump in how much people were asking for microgreens. Um, and I'm the only one that sells there. And so... They asked me to put together, you know, like a product list that I could show them uh, with some pictures and some descriptions and stuff. And then they created their own tab on that website just for my microgreens. And that worked out really, really well. I tried to keep the products really simple. So basically what I listed for them was uh, pea shoots, radish, broccoli, arugula, a chef's blend, um, Trying to think of what else it was. There's red rock cabbage. Uh, not much more than that. That's probably just about it. Uh, two varieties of the radish. I did a uh, the purple radish, like a Rambo radish, 
which I called, I renamed Cosmic Radish. Just a marketing thing. Didn't really do a whole lot for it, but I still think it's cool. I like it. You can take that if you want, use it. Um, you can use any of the purple varieties, really, and just call it Cosmic Radish. And anyways, that went off really well to start out. It, things were selling. They were, they were contacting me, being like, when are we getting more? Because we're selling out of stuff. And that's where the difficulty also came in, though, is I would, there was one in particular, like arugula. Suddenly, everybody wanted arugula. Arugula was never one of my best sellers as a microgreen before. Um, I think it's one of the best tastes in microgreens, but it's not like one of the most... Uh, it doesn't really stand out as far as how it looks. So for restaurants, they always want, in my experience, a colorful microgreen because they're using them primarily as a garnish. And so they really want to pop and stand out. But when it comes to your average consumer, they're looking for flavor and they're looking for nutrition and things like that. They don't care if it stands out as much. I mean, it does still help to sell when they see a package that looks really beautiful. So anyways, I ramped up my arugula production and started bringing more. Next thing I knew, when I would go to replace packages, um, arugula was one of the ones that were left on the shelf. So it went from when I was delivering arugula, the lady I was dealing with was like, thank God you're here because I've got orders for arugula. And she's taking them from me as I'm putting them out and saying, I have, I have orders for these. Two, coming back and being like, nobody's buying the arugula all of a sudden. So it's really difficult to gauge your market. Like one week of having a ton of sales in one item, that doesn't always translate to what the next week is going to be. Uh, consumers are really weird like that. And there, there can be things to think about there too. Like, could it be that your arugula sounded great the way you described it. A lot of people wanted it and they tried it. Maybe it wasn't as good as they thought it was going to be, or maybe your quality wasn't as good as you thought it was, or uh, there's a whole host of reasons that maybe you turned a customer off of that product after they bought it. Which brings me to another thing you could ramble about that I've never done, which is kind of like get feedback from customers. My chefs always told me my products were... Uh, Phenomenal, like better than what they've ever had before because they're used to getting microgreens shipped in sometimes from, you know, 500 plus miles away. Who knows how old they are? They're already crap the day they opened them up. And so they always loved my microgreens. But when a consumer buys them, it might have been on the shelf for three, four days, maybe even longer. Who knows what that quality was like? It probably wouldn't hurt for me to find a way to... Uh, be able to survey the customer and ask them, what did you think of the product when you bought it? What was the, what was the quality of it? Was, uh, is it? was it all as fresh as you had hoped it would be? Or was it you know, starting to wilt? Was it soggy? Was it wet? Um, was the flavor not what you expected? So that's all a whole big rabbit hole we could go down. Like I said, this is a ramble video. So if you want to hear more rambling, stick with me. So the other big thing about selling to a small retail location or any, even if it's a big retail location, this is going to still stand. So a lot of people that sell produce or microgreens or anything, they have basically two uh, or maybe even three price models. So you have your price model of the farmer's market or direct to consumer, where that's kind of probably your full price. So in my case, for most of my microgreens, that would be $6 for a two ounce clamshell. And when I sold to restaurants, my personal price model was the same. So I didn't discount unless they bought a lot. And none of my, my restaurants were buying like in bulk. Nobody was buying a pound of anything. Uh, most of them I would go and make a delivery for like four to six two ounce packages. And at that, I can't discount that much because it just doesn't make sense. Like, why would I drive where I live? Everything's far away. So I, why would I drive 20 minutes to 30 minutes one way for a, let's say, $20 deal? 
that doesn't make any sense at all. So I didn't discount those. Um, what I did do with restaurants, though, is at times I'd let them pick out what they wanted. Um, and then sometimes maybe throw in an extra package and be like, you know, I think you should try this too. I, I want you to have this. Go ahead and use it. And that helps build a good relationship with your customer. Um, a lot of times it was because I had it anyways. And I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it at that point. So that was the model number two, which most people, like I said, that sell the restaurants and go through a lot, they're given a huge discount because they're buying in bulk. And I would do that too, but a lot of my restaurants are just not that big. So the third price model is retail. Now retail, they have to be able to make money off of your product. And the more money they can make off your product, the more your product they're going to want to sell. What I've learned from dealing with people in retail is that what they expect to be able to mark up your product is at least 30%. Like that's kind of like the bare minimum, 30% markup. Um, what I've been doing is selling for, at my cost of $4 a package, a two ounce package, and they mark it to $6. So it doesn't cost the end user and consumer any more than it costs if I was to sell it directly to them. It's the same price. The difference is the retailer makes you know $1.99 or $2 per package, which is fair. You know, like they're, they have the cooler, they have the location, they're paying for all that stuff. They're doing some of the marketing for me. Um, it, it totally makes sense. Now, the, the big thing comes to with, when it comes to retail, when you're talking a 30% margin on such an expensive product that takes up such a small amount of space, they're obviously going to want to promote that product and sell as much as they can. Because when you think about it, like say a iceberg head of lettuce, it's a, you know, a good size chunk and they're selling it for like a dollar 50. And so they're probably making 30 cents guessing off that head of lettuce where my product, which is in a little box, a little tiny cube, uh, they're selling it for $6 and they're making $2 off each one. So you can see why to retailers, that's a, uh, it's a strong desire to sell as much as they can. But for me, I'm obviously taking a, a huge pay cut that I would if I was selling those individually. Um, I'm losing $2 per package per sale, which is substantial when you, when you think about uh, how much cost goes into that, which I've discussed that in previous videos. Luckily, the cost is not that significant. The, the package itself is like... 16 cents the label is actually probably another five cents the uh the seeds that went into that product uh, i have a calculator that will explain that on microgreensmaster.com check that out if you want that site's about to change dramatically um but it's probably 20 cents maybe that went into that so it was less than a dollar of my cost into that product not counting labor you count labor and everything starts changing, but even even still, it's profitable. I, I can sell to retail and still make my $20, $25 an hour of labor after cost. So it's still a good deal. The reason that it ends up being a really good deal is that you sell a lot more. So if I was selling to restaurants and I'm doing you know, five packages here, driving over there, five packages there, going to see this guy and find it out he doesn't want any this week. You know, they're not going to tell you that in advance. Um, it, it goes around and around. When I go to a retailer, it's like, okay, I'm here and I'm dropping off 25 packages today. And they're paying me for all of them right there on the spot. So that's $100. Usually I'm doing more than 25, 25 packages. Um, it's all at one time. It, it's not real critical about when I show up when at a restaurant. It's like I have to make sure I get there at a certain time. It has to be like between um, after lunch ended and before dinner starts. And so it's kind of a, a critical thing when you're dealing with a restaurant that you get there at appropriate time. With my retailers, it doesn't even have to be an exact day. And I can get there pretty much any time I want. Um, it's basically in my best interest to make sure I get there at a good time, at a good day, before my product is starting to go bad or being pulled off the shelves. And like you want to make sure you're on top of that. 
So what my routine usually looks like when I go into one of my small retailers is I go in there with uh, my one or two insulated bags and I'll just start pulling out all the product that I'm leaving them, you know, 25, 30 packages or whatever. And I hand it all to one of the produce managers or people that I've built a relationship with. They'll mark it with the price. They put their own uh, UPC code on it and everything. They did, did all that themselves. And then I will go to the cooler that has my microgreens that are available for customers. And I'll do my own inspection at that point. If I see something that is, you know, at its best buy date, which I do that at retail. Um, if I'm not doing retail, I do harvest the date. But I find that when it's retail, people don't see the harvested and they see the date. And so the day it was harvested, they're going to think that's the best buy date because they're not always going to look at that. So if something's getting close to the best buy date, I'll pull that. Typically right now, I am adding 14 days to the harvested date is the best buy date. So you have two weeks. Some products do better than others when it comes to that. But anyways, if it's getting close to that date, I pull that off. I mark on my little sheet. These are how much, um, how many products I gave you. And here's how many products I removed. And I pop those off the total. And so basically, it's a rotating schedule. So I might have delivered $125 worth of product. But I pulled $25 off the shelf, $25 worth off the shelf that I didn't think was appropriate to be on the shelf anymore. Mark that $25 off and I walk out with $100. And so that's always cycling. I find it's more important to make sure there's an abundance of your product on the shelf than to try to like figure out exactly how many to have. Because the second you run out of something, could be that you missed out on a sale or several sales. I would rather have to toss out a couple packages that uh, didn't sell than to miss out on any sales at all. And this also protects the retailer. So they have zero risk. The only risk that they have is that if your product never sells, they were using space they could have used to sell something else. But the other big thing is that they're not going to lose a dollar. I like to do the method like I just discussed where I get paid up front. So I, I charge them up front for everything I delivered, and then I discount what I rotated out. Um, some places I've dealt with like to have a, you deliver it, you give them a slip of what you delivered, and then when you come back to deliver again, they tell you what sold, they pay you for what sold, and you take away what didn't sell for free. I don't care for that model as much. Um, it just feels like a lack of trust. But the places that let me deliver whatever I want, they pay me on the spot, and they trust that I'm going to take care of them at the back end. I'll never stick them with the product. I'll never leave them you know, with a bunch of stuff that they had to toss out that uh, all of a sudden... I disappear, you know, I took my money and ran, didn't come back. Uh, I would never do that. And the people that pay me up front, they know that. And so that works out better for me. It's also easier to figure out than having to like figure out what sold, what didn't. Were you keeping track of stuff that sold or did somebody find some stuff that went bad and they tossed it out? So now it's on the shelf and I think it sold, but it didn't sell. And I don't know, now know to discount you for that. I did warn you that this video was going to be a little bit of a ramble, right? So anyways, to make a long story short, I am still doing just fine. I, I really haven't taken a huge hit in sales. Uh, if anything, I might even be doing a little more in sales, but probably a small hit in profit because like I said, I'm not getting full price for my product anymore, but I am selling more of it. And so I just wanted to explain that to you because I've had several of you ask, you know, how are things going during COVID? I didn't make a video right away about it. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. One of them is I didn't want to look like somebody who's like trying to take advantage of making an, another COVID video. You know, there's so many people on YouTube that are like just trying to take full advantage of the situation. And if they put 
anything about COVID or anything like that in their their title or talk about it, that all of a sudden like that's going to get a lot of traction. Um, I kind of waited for things to die off a little bit. I'm just making this as an honest video of what my experience has been. And the other reason is I didn't know what was going to happen. It feels like we went through four months or so of just like confusion. <laughs> like it, it's it's been weird. I'm sure it's been weird for a lot of you or probably all of you. Um, I felt like we were living in a movie. I still feel that way today. It's like definitely feels like a movie to me. Just does not, not feel like real life. Um, it's not what I've ever lived through in my whole life. I'm 40 years old. I've never lived through anything like this. Um, I've got two young kids that are living through this. I've been one of the very, very fortunate ones who, even though I wasn't considered an essential worker, as a software developer, I was already working uh, probably 50% of the time at home. And so now I've been I was doing 100% work from home for like three plus months. And now I've been going back to the office for two days a week. And uh, so I wasn't financially impacted hardly at all, if at all, by COVID. Um, I did lose all my restaurant sales. I still haven't heard from them. I haven't reached out to them yet. I don't feel like it's the right time. They're still all struggling with uh, just even trying to figure out how to get through this. Some of them might have even went under, out of business. I don't know. Um, other ones I do know are doing well, but they're doing mostly curbside orders. And I'm not sure that microgreens really is something they're interested in, adding on the cost of their product to be able to do a curbside order where if you use it as a garnish, I just don't, I think they're probably not getting their money out of it. But there's so much opportunity out there I did not tap into that I still could. I think right now is like an ideal time to start making a microgreen salad mix, which I've always wanted to do. Um, and that's where it's not just microgreens. It's like I would make a salad myself at home. So you would take like, you know, full size arugula, full size, you know, lettuce of some sort, some spinach, whatever, and then dump in a bunch of your own microgreens and mix it all up. I do that all the time at home. That could be a huge seller to restaurants, to retailers, everything. I haven't done it because I've always wanted to do it completely myself. I didn't want to buy any of that product and then mix into my own. It's also uh, gets into a little bit more regulation. Uh, you're, you're probably going to want to wash your product if you do that. Maybe you don't have to, but probably should. I, there's going to be more regulations and such, but... Anyways, that's a topic for another day, and we may go down that topic very soon. With that, that's going to pretty much do it for this video, and I, I hope it was informative. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope if you have questions about anything I rambled about, I'll be happy to expand on that further in the comments. So definitely leave a comment. If there's something I can enlighten you on that I went through or an idea that I have or an idea you have, let's talk. You know, I almost, I try to respond to every single comment. Uh, some slip through that sometimes I don't get a no notification for, for whatever reason. Uh, but I generally do reply to all of them. So thanks for watching. I appreciate it. See you in the next video.